Hello, my guest on EITV now is Mary Riddell, the columnist with the Observer newspaper. Mary, hello. Hello, Julia. You cover a range of topics every Sunday, but are there any that you return to with frequency and are there any you wish you could cover and don't? Well, I am pretty free range, I suppose. The ones that tend to crop up time and again, I'm very interested in youth justice. I'm interested in Iraq, Iran, Darfur, foreign policy, that, you know, the sort of major foreign policy issues that uh, columnists can't and, and shouldn't, I don't think, ignore. Um, I'm interested in monarchy and the constitution, but clearly you do have to range fairly widely. You have to, you know, follow the stories of the week and, and sometimes not follow the stories of the week. Otherwise, if you harp on the same things all the time, you would, I think, risk boring yourself and more relevantly, the readers half to death. So, uh, a I think it's unlikely, I think I can say with certainty, it's unlikely likely you would bore the reader but do you ever feel that um, the discipline of a, of a columnist is radically different from that of a news journalist that all you have to do is have an opinion rather than get facts right? Oh absolutely not no I mean I think if you just kind of scratched your head on a Friday morning and thought now what will I do this week it would sort of be hopeless I mean I think you, you, you absolutely have to get your facts right and you have to have whatever you're writing about you have to have some sort of um, depth uh, underlining that and, and research and so on. I mean, I, I think there is a sort of particular style and technique and columnists write in different ways. So I think that package is perhaps more important than news, which is obviously a more straightforward commodity. But alas, I don't think it means you can take any shortcuts. But do you think there's a danger sometimes that columnists who do have a regular berth they write weekly, sometimes they write more than once a week, they tend to disengage because they have to write speed and length and they are perhaps a little rushed with their opinion. I'm absolutely not asking you to name names, but I'm wondering whether there is a little bit of a culture amongst the commentariat sometimes of being careless and that they have great impact nonetheless. Well, I think, you, you know, all, everybody writes columns they sort of wish they hadn't or, or advances uh, opinions that they have... Uh, revised since. So there's that. But also, I think columnists are very dependent on the people behind them. I mean, for a start, you're at the mercy of the news agenda. So half the time, you'll be doing one thing and something better will crop up. And also, I'm very sort of fortunate because I don't often get, you know, told to change at the last moment or whatever. Mm. I don't know whether other people do sometimes. Um, but, but, but you've got to rely, in a sense, on an editor and a commentator nerve as well because obviously things are changing all the time what looked sort of terribly attractive on Friday lunchtime might look less beguiling by sort of 11 o'clock on on Saturday so it's actually being able where possible and sometimes you do just have to do something at the very last moment where possible just to have some time to sort of think and prepare and, and speak to people actually about it and uh, I think if you lose that then then that does get a bit tricky and where are you on outside influence is it at all problematic for you to be contacted by somebody you respect in a corporation or in a political party or in a PR firm and told I think you might be interested in this based on what you write about we've got a report coming up or so-and-so is about to give a speech. Does that make you cringe a bit or you think, great? No, I, I like that. You know, clearly if you're being sort of beleaguered on all sides, but it's, so, it's very useful often to know what's coming up. Now, clearly I, and I'm sure every uh, columnist in the world, has about 25 people a week telling them, you know, what they should be writing their column on or, or all sorts of brilliant suggestions, which of course you filter. And I always say quite genuinely that I haven't a clue what I'll be writing about until at least you know, sort of Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, and often much later. So I think as long as you're not in hock to anyone else's agenda or anyone else's views, then the more information you get, absolutely the better. And this business about the power of the commentariat, it's something that editorial intelligence is very interested in and, and becoming, trying to make more evidence-based. How, how much do you believe that a coterie of commentators, particularly press-based but increasingly blog-based, clearly influence the direction of public policy and political party policies? Well, I, I think that stuff is, is read and hopefully um, noted. You know, I'm not talking about my columns in particular, but certainly there are commentators who, um, you know, I, I mean, you, you, you would hope that, that views are 
logged and taken seriously because I think the job of the commentator isn't you know to provide a polite echo to politicians it's to be very contrarian it's to pull them up short it's to make them think again equally I think if politics simply ran to a media agenda however benign or otherwise then that wouldn't be a good thing either so I think it's very good to have that sort of dialogue and the nice thing about being sort of maybe a little outside the political fray is that you, 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 you don't have to sort of go back the next day. You know, clearly people have contacts who they talk to regularly and people hopefully, hopefully who trust you and think you'll be fair about things. But I think, um, I think commentators do have to be um, very, very independent. So I suppose you'd hope you, you, you'd have some influence, but... Um, hope that also you, you'd be you're talking to the general public I think you're not just talking to a few people in Westminster and it's very nice to be able sometimes to strike a chord there as well. Do you feel sometimes you're second guessing what the public's going to feel or reflecting what they feel? Well I don't actually do either I mean I think if you start to imagine your constituency then uh, you know people who sort of read you what they want to hear that's a bit sort of dangerous because sometimes I think you've actually got to offend your natural constituency I suppose and uh, now that we're all on comment is free if you do they're very quick to let you know well I just before I let you go I just want to ask who do you admire most in the commentary what blogs do you read which other commentators do you rate and you know if you had four or five people that you would could only have time to read who would they be well, I read comment free. I don't read a huge number of blogs, probably not as many as um, I should do. Uh, I like Polly Toynbee very much. She's so well tapped in and, and her stuff is so well sourced. I like Simon Jenkins for his rage and his anger and his um, wisdom acquired over a long time. Um, I like some of the male's columnists, actually, who are very professional and very elegant. I like Stephen Glover, although... Uh, I don't think our politics are, are, are at all the same, and um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I like some of the Times people too, whose views I don't agree. But I think I'd say Toynbee and Jenkins would be uh, the ones I would, uh, I would always read. Well, Mary Riddell, thank you very much for joining us today on EITV. Pleasure. Thank you.